A few months ago, one of our subscribers, Nishal, was hit by the tech layoffs, just like hundreds of thousands of other people were. Now, four months later, he got a $200,000 per year job after receiving multiple offers. He's working at Oracle. We actually just hired him at Dev Lunch, and he's doing better than ever. Now, I want to explain exactly what we did with Nishal to get him to this point so that you can learn those lessons and you can follow along with the exact same process. Now, when Nishal came to us, just like many other developers, he had this skill, right? He's not missing the skills. He doesn't need to build a new portfolio project. Doesn't need to learn C++. He knows how to code. He's a competent developer. He's worked at companies before. The issue is almost never skills. It's always the presentation of those skills and the positioning. So the first thing that we did with Nishal was really a complete overhaul of his social media. So that includes pretty much just his LinkedIn, as well as his resume to really pitch him as an expert. Now, in Nishal's case, we targeted more of a back-end type position, whereas before he was really general, kind of all over the place. We worked on his resume, we worked on his LinkedIn, and we made sure that it was clear that Nishal was an expert in back-end development. Now, while using the word expert is always, you know, a little bit exaggerated, the point is that we wanted to target a specific type of role and pitch him as someone that from day one could come into a company and provide value. Now, one of the mistakes that most developers make, and this includes includes Nishal, is they think that having a more general profile where they have multiple languages, maybe they're full stack, or they're kind of just branding as a generalist, means that they're going to qualify for more roles, right? Okay, if I'm really general, if I have seven programming languages on my resume, you know, all of these thousands of jobs that are in my area, I can potentially apply to all of them. Now, while that thinking kind of makes sense at a surface level, it's actually the complete opposite of what's working in today's market. A few years ago, sure, that was the case because software developers, sorry, were much more in demand. But in today's market where it's a lot more competitive and there's a lot more noise, you need to use the opposite approach. This means that you need to pick a niche or a specialty and you need to really present yourself as an expert in that area. This way, you don't have to apply to thousands of jobs and the few jobs that you do actually target and apply to, you qualify for. Now, I'm just gonna give you a quick example to kind of really crystallize this for you because I know a lot of you don't believe me after hearing that. And there's a student that we worked with in DevLunch. Now he came in and he was telling me that he applied to about 15 companies and he got eight or nine responses. Now, he was actually saying that as if it was a bad thing, and he was wondering why he didn't hear back from those other companies. Whereas in my mind, I'm like, what the heck? That's incredible. What are you doing to get those responses? Now, what he told me makes complete sense. He was applying only to self-driving car companies in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Guess what he was doing before? Working for a self-driving car company. He had like expertise in robotics, all of that kind of stuff. So he was as niche as you could possibly get from a location perspective, also from a development perspective, and then from a language tech stack, all of that perspective as well. So because he was so niche, he didn't need to apply to 100 plus companies. He could apply to 15, probably even less, and generate a bunch of opportunities because he matched the profile exactly. So just keep that in mind, if you're not already doing that, and at least niching down between front end, back end, DevOps, something along those lines, you're making a massive mistake. You wanna target fewer positions where you match those more closely. So anyways, that's the first thing we did with the shawl. We really cleared all of that up from understood the strategy and the vision. Okay, where can we actually target? What do we need to do? And then once we did that, we started generating a bunch of opportunities for him. Now, from that point forward, it goes from, okay, we got to generate some opportunities, which we can do by cleaning up the profile to really converting on those opportunities. Now, in order to do that, there's really three main areas that we need to practice, and that's behavioral interviews, technical interviews and system design interviews and system design becomes more and more important at a senior level which is the development role that nishal got senior software developer so with that in mind how do you prepare for that well you can blindly do lead code questions you can read a bunch of books you can have your mom give you an interview but of course that's a recipe for disaster and you don't have a clear vision on what it is that you need to do next so with all of our students, including Nishal, what we do is we set up a roadmap. Now the importance of a roadmap, and you can do this for yourself, you don't need us to do it for you, is you need to have a clear plan and a step-by-step -step guide on what you're gonna do every single day so that there's no question about what the next task is. One of the hardest things to do when you're grinding for months trying to land an interview or to pass an interview is you have to know what to do next. And if you have to wake up in the morning and come up with that activity, it's very unlikely that you're actually gonna get it done. So for Nishal, we kind of, you know, did a mixture of tasks for him. We did a little bit of behavioral interview prep, which is essentially writing out the common interview questions, 
practicing your answers, developing an interview bank from all of the interviews that you've attended with the questions that you've been asked, as well as what the ideal kind of bullet point answer would be. The idea here is that you don't want to memorize the answers, but you want to have stories in the star format prepared for all of these common questions. So even if you could ask a variant of that question, you know the key point that you can go back on. Now this goes back to what we were talking about before. You want to provide evidence that you know what you're doing and you can provide value. And the only way to do that is to connect that to a real world experience which is really a story of some sort, right? And to keep someone engaged by telling a story. Then we get into the technical interviews. Now, this essentially involves getting really good at lead code, which really means understanding the patterns, not just memorizing them, and how to present your thought process. So with Nishal specifically, we did multiple mock interviews. We staggered them, so about one every two weeks, where what we were focusing on was seeing an improvement, not just in the technical side of things in terms of how he wrote code, but how he communicated. So we gave him a list of about 100 lead code questions. We had him go through about two problems per day and around kind of, you know, 25% mark of all of those problems, we ran the mock. Now, when you do these types of lead code problems, it's very important that you don't just put your head down, bang on your keyboard, and you know, spend three hours working on the same problem. You need to time box yourself. You need to simulate a real interview environment. And you need to focus on doing enough problems that you understand the patterns and the different techniques you have within those patterns so that you can simply go back to those in an interview. That means that even if you don't get a problem you've seen before, you're still able to get some progress on it because you know the relative pattern you should be using. You have some tools that you've seen in your toolbox before, and then you can go with that. So that's exactly what Nishal did. I think he did something like 120 problems. And then again, continuous mock interviews so he could follow the framework that we gave him, which is very well known online in terms of how to answer these types of problems. I don't have enough time in this video to get into the exact framework, but anytime you're in a technical interview, there's a very strict set of steps that you need to follow. We taught Nishal that he mastered it by doing a bunch of mock interviews. When he got into his interviews, he saw very quickly that if he just relied on that framework, it was a lot less stressful. He could get through, he could make progress, and that's how he was ultimately able to pass and receive multiple offers. If that's kind of the technical interview side of things, really, again, to summarize, do enough problems that you start to really pick up your pattern recognition, do enough mock interviews and practice like you play, simulating a real interview environment so you know how to communicate, you know how to explain your thought process, and learn the procedure, the step-by-step -step thing that you have to go through in every single interview. If you do that, you're already ahead of 90% of people, and you know exactly what you need to do. You just need to kind of complete all of those small steps, which is a lot easier than trying to solve the entire problem at once. Now, after that, we get into system design. Now, system design is obviously a little bit more difficult. It's more of a senior level topic. Inside of DevLaunch, we have a very detailed system design roadmap, which we gave to Nishal, and we guided him in terms of the types of topics that we needed to do here. But more importantly, we gave him system design questions, which were trying to simulate the types of questions he was gonna get asked in the interviews that he had. So for example, he had interviews with Oracle, right? At Oracle, they're very famous for giving certain types of system design questions. We knew we had that type of interview, so we went online, we researched all of the Oracle type questions, and we specifically studied those. So we're being very targeted. We're not just doing generalized prep. When we know we have an interview coming up, that's what we need to work on, right? We need to do as much research as we possibly can, reach out to our connections, the people that we know that have worked at a company like Oracle, get the common questions that they've been asked in all of those variants and practice that. This way we can focus on 20 or 30% of a system design curriculum rather than the whole thing, which is just impossible to master in a short period of time. Now also I wanna note here that Nishal was completely immersed in this. This was all he was focusing on, was just getting as good as he possibly can at interviews practicing the system design questions, you know, researching every day, looking on forums, looking on X, etc. If you do that and you put your whole headspace around landing these types of jobs, obviously it's a lot easier to do that and you're completely committed, which he absolutely was. Sure, we gave him the guidance, but he ultimately executed the steps, which is why he was able to land this position. So those are the main steps, right? We have to do the preparation, we have to be prepared, but then we also need to perform on the day. Now, the best way to perform on the day is to go in remembering the preparation that you've done. I always say this, but when I had my Microsoft interview, I was extremely relaxed because I knew that I had done as much prep as I possibly could. And no matter what happened, I had prepared myself how I felt was you know fair to prepare. So even if I fail, even if I get asked a difficult question, it's not really on me at that point because I've done everything I possibly could have. I knew that I had the right plan. I knew that I had the right study process and that's what you need to have as well. If you don't have that, it's obviously gonna be a lot more nerve wracking, but if you go in knowing that you've done a lot of prep, 
you're just a lot more relaxed. So you really need to keep the nerves calm. You need to obviously kind of perform under pressure, which you know involves keeping the nerves calm. And you need to more importantly, communicate clearly and confidently and demonstrate that you can provide value from day one. Now in Nishal's case, he had multiple interviews. He did not pass all of them. If I recall, he had four or five interviews and he passed two and received two offers. And what he was able to do is he was able to leverage those offers against each other to negotiate a higher salary. So at Oracle, I believe they were offering him something around an 180, 190K per year. And then what he was able to do is negotiate his other offer and say, hey, I have this other offer as well. You know, I'm thinking of potentially going here. Can we bump it up? And I believe his total comp, you know, bonus, stock, all of that salary was around $220,000 after this negotiation because he was in a position of leverage he was actually able to decide what job he wanted. Now, this is another point that's important. When you have that leverage and you have multiple companies looking for you, you have lots of opportunities in the pipeline. Again, that allows you to be a lot more relaxed. And when you go into the interview, you can treat it like a two-way street, which is exactly what he did, where he's also asking questions of the interviewer, why should I want to work here? What am I going to be working on? You know, what's the most fun thing you've done? Whatever, right? All of those common questions where when you go in and you know that you have another offer in your back pocket, it allows you to really change kind of the tone of the interview where you're no longer in this position where you're desperate for a job. You're genuinely wondering what is the better company to work for? When you have that real genuine desire to know that information and you're asking those types of questions, the dynamic completely shifts and you go to someone who's a lot more desirable. I say this many times, but people always want to hire people that have other offers, right? That already have a job. The people that are the most desired, other people desire simply because it kind of alludes to the fact if someone else wants you, I should probably want you too. It's not always true, but that is what typically happens. And it can't be more true when it comes to landing a job. So anyways, that is a quick kind of breakdown of what we did with Nishal. To summarize, the most important thing at the beginning is that positioning, right? That specialization speaking to our expertise. Then we start getting into the preparation. We need to understand behavioral interviews, technical interviews, and system design interviews, and how to convert those. We did that with him. He started generating opportunities. He generated a bit of leverage with that first offer that he received. He was calm, he did the prep, he followed the roadmap and the plan, and he was consistent, right? And that's another important part, staying consistent, building that momentum, doing the small tasks every single day. That's what leads to the results. This isn't gonna happen overnight. It takes some time. For Nishal, I believe it was about eight weeks before the first offer. And then the Oracle offer, I believe, was about 12 weeks. Anyways, I hope this video was helpful. If it was, leave a like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.